Chapter One. Emil goes to the city. Now, Emil said, "His mother, get ready. Your clothes are on your bed. Get dressed, and then we'll have our dinner." Yes, mother. Wait a minute. Have I forgotten anything? Your other clothes are in your case. There's some food for your journey. These flowers are for your aunt. I'll give you the money for your grandmother after dinner. No, that's all. I think. Emil left the room, and Mrs. Fisher turned to her neighbour, Mrs. Martin. My son's going to the city for two or three weeks. At first, he didn't want to go, but what can he do here while his school's closed? My sisters asked us again and again to visit her. I can't go, because I have so much work. Emil's never travelled alone before, but he's old enough now. He'll be all right. His grandmother's going to meet him at the station. I think he'll enjoy the city," said Mrs. Martin. "All boys like it. There are so many things to see. I must go now, Mrs. Fisher. Goodbye." Emil came back into the room and sat down at the table. His hair was tidy, and he was wearing his best jacket. While he ate, he watched his mother. I mustn't eat too much, he thought. She won't like it when I'm going away for the first time. But his mother was thinking about other things. Don't forget to write to me when you arrive, she said. All right. Give my love to your aunt. And your grandmother, and your cousin Polly, look after yourself, and be good. I don't want anyone to say that you're not a polite boy. I promise. After dinner, Emil's mother went to the sitting room. There was a tin box on one of the shelves. She took out some money, and came back to the table. Here's seventy pounds," she said. Five ten-pound notes, and four five-pound notes. Give your grandmother sixty pounds. I couldn't send the money to her before, but I've worked hard and I've saved it for her. The other ten pounds is for you. Your return journey will cost about three pounds. Use the other seven pounds when you go out. I'll put the money in this little bag. Now don't lose it. Where will you put it? Emil thought for a minute. Then he put the bag into the pocket inside his jacket. It'll be safe there, he said. His mother looked serious. You mustn't tell anyone on the train about the money. Of course not," said Emil. Some people think that seventy pounds is not a large amount of money, but it was a lot of money to Emil and his mother. Emil's father was dead, so his mother worked hard all day. She paid for their food and clothes, and for her son's books and his school. Emil realized that his mother worked hard. So he really tried to do well in class. She was always pleased when he got a good report from his teacher at the end of the year. Let's go now," said Mrs. Fisher. "You mustn't miss the train. If the bus comes along, we'll take it." The country bus was very old and slow. Emil and his friends wanted modern buses in Newton, but other people in the town. Liked their old bus. They liked the driver too. He always stopped at your house for you. You called out, and the driver stopped. But it was often quicker to walk. The bus came, and Emil and his mother got on. They got off at the square in front of the station.
Then they heard a deep voice behind them. Where are you going? It was Newton's chief of police. Emile's mother said, My son's going to visit his grandmother for two or three weeks. Emile felt silly. He was remembering something. In the centre of the station square, there was a statue of a very famous judge. One day, after school, Emil and his friends climbed up and put an old cap on the statue's head. Then Emil began to paint its nose red. Suddenly the chief of police walked into the square. Oh no, he saw me, thought Emil, as he and his friends ran away. Now, a week later, Emil waited for the policeman to say, Emil Fisher, come with me. You are going to prison. But the policeman didn't say anything as Emil carried his case into the station. Perhaps he was waiting until Emil came back from the city. Mrs. Fisher bought a ticket for Emil. They only had to wait a few minutes for the train. Don't leave anything on the train, and don't sit on the flowers. Someone will lift your case up for you. Don't forget to say please. I can lift the case up, said Emil. I'm not a baby. All right. His mother was looking serious again. You must get out at the right station in the city, she said. It's the East Station, not the West Station. Your grandmother will be by the ticket office. I'll find her mother. Don't throw paper on the floor of the carriage when you eat your food. And don't lose the money. Emil opened his jacket and felt in his pocket. Don't worry, he said. It's safe. The train came into the station. Emil kissed his mother and climbed into a carriage with his case. His mother gave him the flowers and food. Is there a seat for you? she asked. Yes, said Emil. Be good and write to me. You must write to me too. Of course. Now be nice to your cousin Polly. The carriage doors were shut, and the train moved slowly out of the station. Mrs. Fisher waved her hand for a long time. Then she turned round and went home. She felt sad, but she only cried for a short time. She had to do her work. Chapter 2 The Thief Emil took off his school cap and said, Good afternoon, to the other people in the carriage. He sat opposite a fat lady. She was only wearing one shoe, because her left shoe hurt her foot. She was sitting beside a man with a big nose. Boys are not usually so polite, she said to the man. As she talked, she moved her painful foot up and down. Emil put his hand in his pocket. He wasn't happy until he felt the little bag. He looked at the other people in the carriage. They didn't look like thieves. There was another woman sitting to the right of the man with the big nose. She was sewing, making a cap for a baby. At the window, next to Emil, a man with a black hat was reading a newspaper. Suddenly, the man put down his paper and took some sweets from his pocket. Would you like one? he asked Emil. Thank you very much, said Emil, taking one of the sweets. My name's Emil Fisher, he said. The other people in the carriage smiled in a friendly way. The man lifted his hat and said, My name's Green. 
Then the fat lady asked Emil, Does Mr. Smith still own the cloth shop in Newton? Oh, yes, said Emil. Do you know him? Yes, I'm Mrs. James from Greenfield. I hope he's well. Can you tell him that? Yes, of course, replied Emil. Are you going to the city? Mr. Green asked Emil. Yes, my grandmother's meeting me at the East Station ticket office. He felt in his pocket. The paper money in the bag made a little noise. It was still there. Do you know the city? No. Well, it will surprise you. Some of the houses there are 600 metres high. They tie the roofs to the sky. Then the houses don't move in the wind. And what do you do if you want to get to another part of the city quickly? Do you know? No, Emil answered, thinking, This is a strange man. You're put in a box at the post office, and then you travel by post. And if you have no money, you can get fifty pounds from a bank. But you have to leave your head there. Is your head at the bank? The man with the big nose said. Stop telling the boy stupid stories. The two men began to shout. Fat Mrs. James stopped moving her foot, and the other woman stopped sewing. Emil was happy, because the strange man couldn't talk to him now. He took out his food and began to eat his bread and butter. Then the train stopped at a big station. The two ladies and the man with the big nose got out. Mrs. James was almost too late, because she couldn't get her shoe on. Tell Mr. Smith what I said, she called to Emil as she left the train. Now, Emil and the man with the black hat were alone. Emil wasn't very pleased about this. He didn't want to be with a strange man who gave away sweets, a man who told silly stories. Emil wanted to feel the money again, but not in front of the other man. Then the train started again. Emil went to the washroom at the end of the carriage. He took the little bag out of his pocket and counted the money. It was still there, but how could he make it safer? Then he remembered. There was a pin in his jacket. He took out the pin and pushed it through the bag, the paper money, and the cloth of his inside pocket. The money was safe now. Emil went back to the carriage. Mr. Green was asleep. Emil was glad. Now he didn't have to talk to him. He looked out of the window. He enjoyed watching the trees, the fields, and the houses. Mr. Green continued sleeping. Sometimes he made little noises. Emil watched him. Why did he always keep his hat on? Emil noticed his long face and thin ears. Suddenly, Emil jumped with surprise. I nearly went to sleep. I mustn't do that, he told himself. He didn't like being alone with Mr. Green. Emil wanted more people in the carriage, but nobody came. He kicked his foot to stay awake. He sometimes did this at school in history lessons. For a short time, this helped him. He thought about his cousin, Polly. What did she look like now? It was two years since he last saw her. He couldn't remember her face very well. Some minutes later, he nearly fell off his seat. Have I been asleep? he thought.
he kicked his foot again. Then he counted the flies on the window. He counted them from the bottom to the top. He counted them from the top to the bottom. And then he counted them again. First, there were twenty-four. Then there were twenty-three. Why does the number change? Emil asked himself. Then he fell asleep. When Emil woke up, he was lying on the floor of the carriage. The train was moving. He remembered his dream. It was a bad dream. The policeman from Newton was running after him. He caught him and took him to the stone judge. The judge was alive and said, Emil Fischer, you painted my nose, so you must go to prison. Slowly, Emil began to remember. Of course, he was going to the city. Did he fall asleep, like the man in the black hat? But the man wasn't there. Emil was alone in the carriage. He sat up. His knees were shaking. He got up from the floor. His clothes were dirty, so he cleaned them quickly with his hands. Then he felt in his inside pocket. The money wasn't there. Emil felt a sharp pain and pulled his hand from his pocket. There was blood on his finger from the pin, but there was no little bag there. Emil began to cry. Of course, he was not crying about the blood. He was crying about the money. His mother worked so hard, and now there was no money for his grandmother or for his visit to the city. I've been careless, and a thief has stolen my money. Now what can I do? he thought. How can I get off the train and say to my grandmother, Here I am, but I have no money for you, and you must give me the money for my ticket back to Newton. I can't stay in the city. I can't go home again. There was an alarm above the window at one end of the carriage. Emil thought, If I ring the alarm, the train will stop. A railway guard will come to the carriage. He'll ask, What's happened? What's the matter? And I'll say, Someone's stolen my money. Why didn't you look after it? He'll answer. What's your name? Where do you live? You stopped the train. Now your family will have to pay twenty-five pounds. In fast trains, there is a corridor that you can walk along. It takes you to the place where the guard sits. Then you can report a crime. But Emil was in a slow train. There is no corridor on slow trains. You must wait until the train stops at the next station. What's the time? Emil thought. The train began to pass large houses with bright gardens and tall buildings with dirty windows. The train was moving more slowly now. Emil knew what to do. At the next station, I must call the railway guard and tell him everything. The railway company will tell the police. But then I'll have problems with the police, he thought, remembering his dream. They'll ask the Newton police about me. He imagined the Newton police chief officer's report. Emil Fisher of Newton is not a good boy. He paints the noses of statues. I do not believe that his money was stolen. Perhaps he was careless and lost it, but he probably hid it because he wanted to use it for himself. 
Emil Fisher is the thief. We must put him in prison. Emil thought about the report and was afraid. No, he couldn't tell the police. He took his case down and put on his cap. Then he put the pin back in his jacket and got ready. The train stopped. Emil looked out of the window and saw a sign on a wall. It said, West Station. The doors were opened and people got out of the carriages. Friends were waiting to meet them. Suddenly, he saw a black hat in the crowd. It was some metres away. Was it the thief? Perhaps he stole Emil's money but didn't leave the train. Perhaps he just moved to another carriage while the train was at one of the stations. Emil got out quickly. Then he remembered the flowers. He put down his case and jumped back into the carriage. He got out again with the flowers and picked up his case. Then he ran as fast as he could towards the gate. Where was the black hat? There it was. Or was it a different hat? Emil's case was heavy. He wanted to put it down and leave it. But someone will steal it, he thought. At last, he got through the crowd. He was now closer to the black hat. Was it the thief? No. There was another one. No, that man was too short. Emil ran in and out of the crowd. There! There was Mr. Green, the thief. He was passing through the gate, and he seemed to be in a great hurry. I'll get you, thought Emil angrily. He gave his ticket to the railway man, put his case in his other hand, and with the flowers under his right arm, ran after the black hat. It's now or never, he thought. Chapter 3 Emil Goes After the Thief Emil wanted to run after the man and shout, Give me my money! But, he thought, the man won't say, Of course, dear boy, here it is. I promise that I'll never steal again. No, now he could only watch the man. A very fat lady was walking in front of Emil. He hid behind her and followed the thief.
I don't know yet, said Emil. Well then, get off at the next stop. No, I can't do that. I must stay here, please, sir. If I tell you to get off, you get off. Do you understand? Oh, give the boy a ticket, said the man who was reading a newspaper. He gave the ticket man some money, and Emil received his ticket. A lot of boys tell me they've lost their money, said the ticket man. Then they laugh at me behind my back. This one won't laugh at you, said the man with the newspaper. Thank you very much, sir, Emil said. Oh, that's all right, the man with the newspaper said. Excuse me, sir, where do you live? Why do you want to know? I want to give you back your money. I'm staying here for a few weeks, so I can bring it to you. My name's Emil Fisher, from Newton. Oh, forget about it, said the man. The tram stopped again. Emil watched. Did the man in the black hat get off? He saw nothing. The tram continued its journey. Emil looked at the beautiful wide roads. He had no idea where he was going. The thief was still sitting in the other carriage. Nobody seemed interested in Emil. Even the kind man was reading his newspaper again. The city was so large, and Emil felt so small. It didn't matter to anyone that he had no money. Two million people lived in the city, and nobody was interested in his problems. What's going to happen? Emil thought. He felt very unhappy. Emil's grandmother and his cousin Polly were waiting for him at East Station. They were standing near the ticket office, looking at the time every minute. A lot of people passed them, carrying boxes, cases and flowers, but not one of them was Emil. Perhaps he passed us and we didn't see him, said Polly. She stood on the platform with her shining new bicycle. She wanted to show it to Emil. He'll want one too when he sees it, she thought. Polly's grandmother was worried. What is the matter? What is the matter? I think the train arrived a long time ago. They waited a few more minutes, then Polly went to ask about the train. A man was standing at the gate, looking at people's tickets. Has the train from Newton arrived yet? Polly asked him. Newton? Oh, yes, said the man. That train arrived a long time ago. Polly went back to her grandmother and gave her the news. Oh, dear! What's happened? What's happened? The old lady said. I think he got out at the wrong station, said Polly. Boys are so stupid. They waited for another five minutes. We can't stay here, said Polly. The next train from Newton is in two hours. Let's go home now. I'll come back here on my bicycle and meet him. I don't like it. I don't like it, said the old lady. When she was worried about something, she always said things twice. At home, Polly's father and mother didn't know what to do. Polly's father wanted to write to Emil's mother. No, don't do that, said his wife. Perhaps he'll be on the next train. I hope he will, said Polly's grandmother, but I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it either, said Polly, shaking her head wisely. Chapter 4 Emil's Friends Make a Plan 
At last, the man in the black hat got off the tram. Emil picked up his case and the flowers, thanked the man with the newspaper, and followed the thief. The thief walked in front of the tram, crossed the road, and continued on the other side. The tram moved away, and Emil saw the man go into a cafe. Now, thought Emil, I must be very careful. There was a house at the corner of the road. He ran into the doorway. It was a good place to hide. From there, he could see the thief easily. Mr. Green was sitting close to the cafe window. He was looking very pleased with himself. He ordered some coffee. Emil didn't know what to do. I can't stay here and watch the man. A policeman will come along and tell me to move, he thought. Suddenly, a horn sounded just behind Emil. He jumped and turned round quickly. A boy stood there, laughing at him. Don't be afraid, said the boy. Did you make that loud noise? asked Emil. Of course, said the boy. You're not from here, are you? Everyone here knows me and my horn. I always carry it with me. No, I'm not from here, said Emil. I'm from Newton. I've just come from the station. Newton? From the country? Is that why you're wearing those silly clothes? Don't talk like that or I'll hit you, said Emil angrily. The other boy looked surprised. I don't want to fight, he said. It's too hot, but I will if you want to. I haven't got time to fight now, said Emil. I'm busy. Busy? You aren't doing anything, just standing in this doorway. Yes, I am, Emil answered. I'm watching a thief. What? Did you say thief? That's right, said Emil. He told the boy about losing all his money. Well, this is wonderful, said the boy as Emil finished the story. It's like a detective film at the cinema. What are you going to do next? I don't know. Look, there's a policeman over there. Let's tell him. He'll help you. I don't think so, said Emil. I did something wrong in Newton. I think the police want to catch me. Oh, I see, said the boy. He thought for a minute, then said, I'll help you, if you want me to. I'd like that, said Emil. My name's Paul, said the boy. And mine's Emil. Well, Emil, said Paul, we must do something. Have you got any money now? Not a penny. Paul sounded his horn softly. It usually helped him think, but it didn't help this time. Can you bring some of your friends here? asked Emil. Good idea, said Paul. I'll run round to their houses and sound my horn. Then they'll come out and help us. OK, but come back soon, said Emil. If the thief leaves, I'll have to follow him. Then you won't know where I am. That's true. But I don't think the man will leave yet. He's eating some eggs. Paul ran off. Emil felt much happier. Friends are a great help when you're in trouble. Emil watched the thief. He was enjoying his meal. Perhaps he was paying for the food with Mrs. Fisher's money. But things were different now. Emil had help at last. Ten minutes later, Emil heard the horn again. 
he saw about twenty boys coming up the road towards him. Paul was in front. What do you think of this? he asked Emil. Great, said Emil, looking at all the boys. I've told them what happened, Paul continued. He turned to the other boys. This is Emil, and the man who stole his money is sitting in that cafe. He mustn't escape. We'll soon catch him, said a boy with a loud voice. This is the captain, Paul said. He then told Emil the names of all the other boys. Well, said the captain wisely, we must begin. First, everyone must give me their money. Each boy threw his money into Emil's cap. A very small boy called Little Tuesday put five pence into the cap. He was very excited because it was his job to count the money. We have eighty five pence, Little Tuesday reported. Three of us will keep the money. If we can't stay together, there'll always be someone with money. Good idea, said the captain. He and Emil each kept twenty pence. Paul took the rest. Emil thanked everyone and said, I'll return the money after we catch the thief, but I can't do much with this case and these flowers. I'd like to leave them somewhere safe. Give them to me, said Paul. I know the man who owns that cafe. I'll leave them with him. And I'll have a good look at the thief while I'm there. Be careful said the captain. We don't want the thief to know you're watching him. When Paul came back, Emil said, Now I think we should have a meeting, but not here. Everyone can see us. We'll go over to the square and sit on the grass, said the captain. But some boys must stay here and watch the thief. They can be the watchers. Two can watch the cafe, and five or six others can stand along the road. If anything happens, they can run to the square. Then we'll come back here. I'll choose the watchers, Paul said to Emil and the captain, and I'll stay here too and watch the cafe. You take the rest of the boys with you. Hurry, it's getting late now. Paul chose the boys that he needed. The rest went to the square with Emil and the captain. They sat down on two long seats in the middle of the square by the grass. They all looked very serious. Then the captain began to speak in a loud voice. His father was a soldier and always spoke like that when he gave orders. It's possible, the captain said, that later we won't be able to stay together. If that happens, we'll need a telephone. Who has a telephone at home that they can use? I have, Little Tuesday called out. My family's out at the cinema tonight. And what's your telephone number? the captain asked. West. Five, four, seven, eight. The captain thought for a minute. He turned to a boy named John. Take this pencil and paper. Cut the paper into twenty pieces. Write Little Tuesday's telephone number clearly on each piece. Then give everyone a piece of paper with the number on it. Little Tuesday's house can be our telephone office. Our detectives must telephone that office when anything new happens. And when we want to know the news, we can telephone that number too. But I'm not at home, said Little Tuesday. No, but you will be, 
the captain answered. Listen to me. We'll finish talking, and then you'll go home and sit by the telephone. It's very important work. John gave out the pieces of paper. Each boy put his piece carefully in his pocket. The captain continued. Some of you must follow the thief, but the others must stay here in the square. Then we'll know where you are. We'll find you if we need you. You can go home now. Tell your families that you'll be very late tonight. But one after the other, not all at the same time. John, you can go home with Little Tuesday. Run back here when there's something to report. I think that's all, isn't it? We'll need something to eat, said Emil. Five boys ran off to get some food. I think you're all being silly, said a boy called Peter. You're talking about food and telephones, but we need to talk about catching this thief. How are we going to catch him? Can we get his fingerprints? said a boy who read a lot of detective stories. Of course not, said John. We can only hope to get back the money that he's stolen. But if we steal the money from him, said the captain, We'll be thieves, too. That's right, said Emil. It's wrong to take something from someone if he doesn't know about it. OK, we've talked enough, said the captain. Now let's do something. We don't know yet how we're going to catch this man, but one thing sure, he must give back the money. I didn't understand what you said about stealing, said Little Tuesday. How can I steal something that belongs to me? I own it, even if it is in another person's pocket. You're too young, said the captain. You can't understand. Are you sure we can all be good detectives? asked Peter. We don't want the thief to know what's happening. He'll escape. Yes, we'll need some good detectives, cried Little Tuesday. That's why you need me. I can be a wonderful police dog, too. I can make a noise like a dog. Nobody listened to him. Perhaps the thief has a gun, said Peter. Then we need brave detectives, said Emil. If anyone's afraid, they can go home to bed. Nobody moved. There's one more thing, Emil continued. I must send news to my grandmother. She doesn't know where I am. She'll go to the police, and we don't want that. Can someone take a letter to 15 Bridge Street for me? I'll do it, said a boy called Robert. Emil asked for a pencil and paper. He wrote... Dear Grandmother, you probably want to know where I am. Please don't worry. I am in the city. I cannot see you yet because I have some important business. But when everything is finished, I will come. Do not ask what this business is. The boy who is bringing you this letter is a friend. He knows where I am, but he cannot tell you because it is a secret. Give my love to Uncle, Aunt and Polly, your loving grandson, Emil. Emil wrote the number of the house and the name of the street on the other side of the paper. Robert took it. The captain gave him the money for his tram ticket and Robert hurried away. The five boys came back with the food. Emil gave some food to each of the detectives. Some of the boys were still at home. Their families did not want them to come out again. The captain gave them all a secret word. The word was Emil, because it was easy to remember. 
When they phoned Little Tuesday, they had to say this word first. If a caller knew the word, they were a friend. The captain turned to Little Tuesday. Please telephone my father. Tell him that I have some important business. I won't be home until late. All right, said Little Tuesday. He went home, taking John with him. Won't your father be angry? asked Emil in surprise. My father knows I'm sensible, answered the captain. I've promised him that I'll never do anything wrong. I can do what I like, but I mustn't break that promise. Why aren't all fathers like that? said Peter. The captain turned to the rest of the boys. I'll leave my money here, he said. We have enough without it. Gerald, you must be the chief. Wait here until we send for you. John will come from Little Tuesday's house if we need help. Are there any more questions? Is everything clear? Our secret word is Emil. Don't forget. Secret word, Emil. The boys cried loudly. All the people in the square looked at them with surprise. Emil was really enjoying himself now. I'm almost glad that thief stole my money, he thought. <laughs>